Welcome back to Your Average Witch, where we talk about witch life, witch stories, and sometimes a little witchcraft on the full and new moon every month. In this episode, we meet Lucia Starza, an English author and witch. We discuss witchy holidays, growing up metaphysical, and how to connect during these trying times. We also talk about her new book, Pagan Portals, Scrying, Divination Using Crystals, Mirrors, Water, and Fire, which is going to be released on March 1st. Now let's get to the stories. Hello, Lucio. Welcome to the show. Ah, oh, hello. Would you please introduce yourself and let people know who you are and what you do and where they can find you? Uh, right. Yes, certainly. I'm Lucia Starza, and uh, I live in London. I'm a witch. I write a blog called A Bad Witch's Blog, um, although I don't mean I'm a wicked witch. Um, <laughs> and you, you can find that at www.badwitch.co.uk. But I'm also the author of a few pagan books published by Moon Books. Uh, they're on candle magic, puppets and magical dolls, guided visualizations, and I've got one on scrying, which is due to be published in February. I actually got to read that, and I don't really do divination. I just, it doesn't come to me very well. I don't feel like I'm good at it, so I don't like to do it. I'd rather, I'd rather let other people who are good at it do for me, do it for me. <laughs> but I, I found a lot of things in your book that I was excited to try out. So that's, I'm excited to talk about it. Oh, great. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, in 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 a way, I think one of the reasons I wrote the book is because, for me, it it did take a lot of effort to get good at scrying I, I took naturally to tarot reading and um um i, I mean I, I, tarot, I read tarot cards for a long while but um scrying was always something that i i loved doing but i struggled to do so i did a lot of trying out different methods reading a few different books on the subject um and got better at it so i felt that i could write a book to help other people who were perhaps um in the same situation. I will be recommending that once it's fully released to everyone else. <laughs> well, thank you. The various groups I wander around in. What does it mean to you when you call yourself a witch? Um, well, um, I mean, I am initiated as a Gardnerian Wiccan, so I'm, I'm kind of initiated as a witch in that sense. I think the word witch means a lot of different things to different people. Um, and I mean, certainly in, in like um, when I was a child, even like in the 1960s, you know, if you called someone a witch, you kind of meant they were a bit of a mean person. Um, but I mean, I think I use it probably more now in the very eclectic sense of like modern pagan witchcraft. So um, it means that I do a variety of different things like um, spell casting um, and, um, and divination. Um, and those kind of practices, as well as as well as being a a, a Wiccan, um, so yes, I I use it in a very eclectic sense. Do you have daily rituals, and if so, would you share some with us? I'd actually say that writing my blog is probably my daily practice. Uh, the reason why I started it, uh, I I was kind of elapsed witch. Um, I had been in a coven quite a few years earlier, but the coven dissipated a bit. You know, people went their separate ways and I hadn't been doing much pagan stuff or much witchy stuff. And I wanted something that really uh, prompted me to, to do more, to, to read more books, to go to more witchy places, to do more things. And so I started writing a blog because I thought, well, you know, I, I that will that I've got to do things in order to write things. So um, I think that is probably my daily practice. But there are also other things that I do do on a regular basis, um, uh, lighting candles for people. I'm often getting requests for people to light uh, for me to light candles for them, to wish them well, or for other things. Um, and also, um, although not on a daily basis, there are a number of different. Um, candle burning ceremonies that I do perhaps at the full moon uh, one of them is is I, I um is peace fires which is like a global movement where um at the full moon people will light a candle or some other kind of fire and uh, wish their 
to be peace throughout the world uh, and a few other things like that is there a website for that or a group yeah www.peacefires.com i think that's interesting that's a good idea mm. and hearing you talk about being in a coven makes me curious i feel like mm, this is pure conjecture on my part but i feel like being in a coven is something that most of the people i talk to here in the u.s are solitary practitioners but i hear way more people in the uk and europe talking about covens mm. well i think that well at the moment i'm solitary um i think that at one time certainly um sort of back in the sort of 1980s um even the 1990s the, the internet wasn't such a big thing there weren't so many different um sort of generic places that you could learn about witchcraft there weren't so many books out there and although there were plenty of solitary practitioners you you really did get the best training in a coven um and that tended to be wiccan covens not always um um there were plenty of others that were not wiccan um so i th i think that it was really the era in which I, I, I got into that kind of, of paganism um, and, and the practice, the training within the, the coven that I, I was in was, was extremely good. Um, it was sort of once a week training evenings that you were really expected to turn up to. And the training was in a variety of different things. And then um, following initiation, um, there were far more rituals and things like that, that um, um, were for initiates only so yeah it was extremely good practice but um I also value being solitary it does allow me to do my own things I, I do find that nowadays I'm I far more do I don't do things quite so rigidly or routinely as when everyone got together at a certain you know the full moon or for a festival and did a set ritual uh, i'm i'm far more eclectic now so i i think there's swings and roundabouts can you imagine a, a group ritual where everybody was doing their own thing no. <laughs> yeah that would be a bit weird <laughs> do you have any family history with witchcraft well, um, my family were pretty witchy, but um, they wouldn't have used the word witch. I mean, uh, back in the sort of 1960s when I was a child, um, as I said, it was you didn't really use the word witch unless you were being nasty about someone. Uh, my, my grandma was an astrologer and a theosophist. Um, uh, my grandma, yeah, uh, she, she worked for Alan Lear, who's quite a famous astrologer and theosophist, um, like back 100 years ago or so. Um, and she worked as his secretary. And um, there was, a, my whole family were kind of into esoteric things. My, my dad, it's on the other side of the family, he um, was quite skilled at dowsing and palmistry and he used to run the palmistry stall at school fate uh, things like that um, so yeah I did come from a slightly weird background do you douse I'm so interested in dowsing I'm not as good as my dad I've I've still got all his I've inherited all his dowsing equipment and I, I do do it sometimes um I'm not too bad with a pendulum particularly uh, um I've, I've always found that using uh like a quartz crystal pendulum is the thing that works best for me uh, um my dad used to go all over the place I mean he well, as a child, we were constantly being taken to sacred sites to dows for ley lines and and things oh. like that. <laughs> That didn't even occur to me to douse for ley lines. Oh my gosh. I would I just want to learn water witching. I would just want to learn that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean I I have used dowsing. I mean, when I've found when I've lost a thing, I sometimes douse for it. But I'm not as good as my dad was. My dad was very good at it. That's so interesting. <laughs> Do you have any stories that you'll share of like that something particularly memorable that happened or that you experienced? Um, hmm. as a child, do you mean? Mm -hmm. 
Well, I do remember going to Stonehenge before when you could just still go right up to the stones, um, which, you know, was was just lovely. You know, you could just go up there and there was no one controlling where you went or where you walked, um, which you can st- they still allow that at, um, like at the solstices, they allow open season. access. Oh. But, but, but what, uh, no, 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 no. It's only really at the solstices. And uh, other than that, you, you have to pay to go in and you can't get very close. You can pay for um, time in the stones. Certain like Druid groups will pay to be allowed to do a ritual in the stones. But no, I mean, when I went there when I was a kid, I remember you know, just parked up at the road and you wandered up and, and there weren't even that many people there as far as I can remember when I was a kid. It was, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, very different from from now that sounds amazing yeah yeah Did it i mean there are still different? yeah yes i'd say so um i'd say so but i mean there are plenty of stone circles in england that y- you can just wander up to still i mean like avebury uh stanton drew um some of the stone circles in the orkneys and there are lots of like smaller stone circles in Cornwall and other parts of the West Country and in the North um, that you can still just wander up to. Uh, so I think if people want that kind of experience, they, it, they, they're they better off going somewhere that isn't Stonehenge. No, I wonder if there's anything like that here. I'm sure there is. I mean, I know I live near Sedona, so I could go to Sedona to experience mm. some stuff, but man. What would you say is your biggest motivator in witchcraft? Ooh. Um, well, I'd say probably it's the need to write a blog post every day. <laughs> I really wait for that. <laughs> I mean, like, for example, it's like, um, you know, like um, tomorrow my husband and I are going to go out and wassail our apple tree. Now, we, we have done that before. Um uh, um, in the past, we've kind of had parties around where we wassail the apple tree. It's just going to be him and me because we're still being a little bit like, um, don't want a huge COVID-y. party around. <laughs> yeah. And you really don't want to be handing around a bowl of beer that you're going to share in <laughs> this day and age. But I mean, the fact that it's like, okay, well, this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to try a very traditional recipe of um, lamb's wool, which is like a mixture of mulled ale with baked apples which I've not tried before Mm. um and it's like well that's something to blog about so like yeah having the blog does spur me on to do slightly different things I relate to that because when I was fooling around with a YouTube channel that's what I that's why Mm. I did anything I was like what can I do for content this week (laughs) Mm. (laughs) I know (laughs) what do you most desire out of your practice oh gosh um well (sighs) that is actually a difficult question and 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 I think that I know in the early days when you know people always sort of said oh it's for personal development oh yes it's for personal development um and nowadays I think it's just more a method of inquiry it's a method of trying to understand the universe, trying to understand the world around and engage with the, I mean, you can see the world in just a totally realist way. You know, it's just material. It's just like, you know, science explains everything. But I think when you engage with it in a magical way, it you experience it in a, in a way that's kind of more intense that you, you experience it at a deeper level. And to me, I think it's that. It's like going to somewhere in nature or even going to an urban place and trying to sense the the kind of the numinous about that place, um, trying to sense the unseen energies that are there. And I think that, for me, is perhaps the biggest motivator. Numinous is such a great word. Mm. Unlike liminal, want to be happy. (laughs) Yeah, unlike liminal, which I also love as a word, but it gets overused. Yeah. What brings you the most joy in your practice? Um, I think it's observing the changing seasons. Um, I think that you know, seeing, being more aware of 
the changes, seeing the leaves grow on the trees and the blossom in springtime and, you know, the, the, the greenery of summer and the golds and reds of the leaves in autumn uh, and the crisp, frosty mornings in winter. I think it's it's the changing seasons. For me, it, it witchcraft, certainly as a Wiccan, it, it's so much about celebrating the the wheel of the year and for me, actually getting out in nature and observing that and and feeling part of that and, and celebrating that rather than just staying indoors and doing a ritual from a book in a living room. So that brings me to this question. Ha- okay, so I live in the desert. Mm. There's no, there are very, very, mm. maybe one crisp morning <laughs> in mm. the year. <laughs> How has how do you feel like environment has shaped your practice? Do you feel like you would be Wiccan if you lived where I live? Probably not. Uh, I think um, like Gardnerian Wicca is very much a religion that grew out of the English climate, the English seasons. Um, and yes, you can use aspects of that wherever you are. But it's going to be different. And I, I think that I would probably not have been attracted to Wicca. I would have been attracted to some practice that was really integral to the magic of that place, um, to the magic of, of the desert. I mean, I, I would imagine that would be amazing. Um, and it really isn't something I I have been to a desert. I've been to um, Egypt. Um Ooh. Yeah, and I mean, I think for me, perhaps if I was in a desert place, I would be looking into the magic of the desert in an Egyptian sense, perhaps. I've only been here two years. I'm from Appalachia, ah. <laughs> so I'm still figuring it out. Mm. And so I'm bringing my Appalachian practices here and having to see how I have to modify things and what sort of things decide that they it's celebratory Mm. times Mm. i mean i don't think you can ditch your what you've done so far it's 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 always things change but i mean yes i mean as my training in wicca whatever i do even though i i you know i'm very interested in in many other different practices it's always going to be there at the back of my mind and to some extent the fact that i was actually um uh baptized as a as a as a catholic and so like there are certain catholic things like um lighting candles to to mary that are, still resonate with me i still see mary as an aspect of the divine feminine so i think that whatever's happened in in your past it's all part of the spiritual path that you're on i am a folk practitioner and i do still bring that with me but things like fall Mm. doesn't really happen here so it, yeah. uh, while i am like hey yay it's Samhain or halloween or whatever it's nice but it's still hot here what i mm. celebrate now is monsoon when we finally have rain and it's finally there's water mm. and green so or in winter like now we're actually after able to grow things this is the growing season for us mm. <laughs> i won't call it spring like but <laughs> mm. And I do really like heat, so summer's mm. not always a good time, but sometimes. Yeah, I know. I, I yeah, I know where you're coming from. I like heat <laughs> as well. <laughs> what would you say is your biggest struggle when it comes to witchcraft? Right. Um. Yeah. I, that is actually quite a difficult one. Um. There are some practices that. I'm not very good at doing. Um, I'm, so, I mean, for example, out of body experiences, it takes a lot of effort for me. It, I've, I've had out of body experiences, but I, there's, you know, so you know, oh, it's really easy, and you know, you read lots of different techniques and practice, and and it's like some people can have out of body experiences, you know, just by wanting to, but for me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm a Taurian. I'm a very embodied person. I'm kind of earthy. Um, and so I suppose anything, 
I'm, I'm, I find things that are m more, yeah, that are more material aspects of witchcraft, like, you know, as I said, the, the seasons, the, 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 the world around me, rather than the more, um, you know, sort of ethereal aspects. So, yes, I do struggle with that. Um, and, yeah, I think everyone has things that they find easier than others. Do you ever feel like you have imposter syndrome? Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, particularly in my writing. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I know on an intellectual level, you know, I, I'm a published author. My books sell well. I, I've, I've worked in publishing all my career, but I still, I read things that other people have written. I think, oh my goodness, that's so good. I could never write anything as good as that. Um, so yes, absolutely. Certainly in, um, in, in my writing, I do. In witchcraft, I, even then, yeah. I mean, I think I teach witchcraft classes, but I'm still learning. I'm, people who come to my classes will teach me things that I didn't know or make me think about things. Um, there, are new, there are always new um, trends in witchcraft um, mm -hmm. or in magic. And someone will say, oh, do you know about this? And it's like, actually no um and there's always that little tiny moment when you think i should know about that and then you think no it's okay it's okay i'm not gonna know everything <laughs> i experience that every time i do an interview because somebody asks <laughs> hey do you know who such and such is or do you understand do you have you heard of this and constantly it's always no <laughs> <laughs> so uh i don't know that it's imposter syndrome but i know i don't know stuff Mm, I'm yeah. not saying I don't have it. Nobody kill, come for me. I, I have imposter syndrome. Just I understand that I don't know things. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's that. But there's always that moment of, you know, there's, oh, I'm an imposter. I'm standing here and I yep. don't know that. <laughs> Everyone should know that. Why don't I know that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. What kind of witchy stuff do you geek out about? Ah, oh, right. What do I get excited about? Um. Well, I really i suppose any of the topics of my books um uh so yes candle magic poppets um scrying guided visualizations and i often find with with well certainly candle magic most people do kind of understand that but certainly with poppets i'm constantly having to explain really what poppets are and guided visualizations again people say you know, once i've explained people say oh i know yes i do that it's a bit like path workings it's happening the other and with scrying again it's like i do have to explain that but i'm really happy to explain to talk about it can you talk about poppets and scrying i'm both interested in both of those Mm, okay. Well, um, I think poppets. It's it's um a, a really it's a really old form of magic. I mean, effigy magic is is really one of the oldest forms of magic there is. Um, you you the apparently the oldest one of the well one of the oldest spells recorded, um, is actually an effigy spell. It's a cure for dog bite, and it comes from ancient Mesopotamia, written down on a tablet in cuneiform or something like that. And um, if you were bitten by a dog in ancient Mesopotamia, what you did was you got a bit of clay and you rubbed it on the wound and you modelled it into a dog, um, perhaps the dog that bit you, and you left it out in the sun to dry. The idea being that as it dried up, so the wound would heal. And if you look through history, um, if, usually clay in the earliest senses of modelled into the um, uh, an image of the thing that was important uh, as a kind of a focus it is is just done all the time, um, and you can see it come all the way through history. Um, the, the ancient Greeks did it. They would make a little dolls called Colossoi um, that were little magical dolls, uh, often for curses then. Um, uh, and the reason why it's called poppets um, in English magic, it's quite an old word from Middle English, and it comes from the same root as the word puppet. And it could mean like a small magical doll, or it could mean a child's toy. And um, that's why I use the word poppet for effigy magic where you make um 
and a doll that represents someone and then it works by sympathetic magic um so um it's easy to visualize for example a healing spell it doesn't have to be a curse a lot of people think it's going to be a curse sticking pins into it but it can be <laughs> healing magic and you know you focus on the doll and the idea is that by sort of sympathetic magic what happens to the doll will happen to the person so yeah there's me there's me um wittering on about um about puppets <laughs> that is so interesting <laughs> thank you I love the thing about the dog bite. Oh my gosh, that is so mm. interesting. And yeah. that's in your that's in your puppet book. Um, I think I mentioned that in my puppet book. I probably do, and it's something I talk about in my workshops. I mean, I actually learned about that from um, oh, a, a historian. I think it was Malcolm Gaskill's book about the history of magic. That's where I learned about that. I mean, I'm. You know, I would love to be able to read cuneiform tablets, but sadly I can't. <laughs> so you mentioned your husband was going to be involved in your apple tree. Uh, we'll say mm. Okay. Uh, does he practice? He's not. He doesn't. He's not a witch. He's not a pagan. He's. Um, uh, but yes, we do do things together. He's. He's really. We we had we we had a hand fasting when we were, when we were married Aww. at um a, 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 a modern stone circle in London. Um, he's very he he's very happy to come along with me to things. He he very happy to you know take part in things like that. He sometimes comes along to open rituals with me. We um often go to talks and workshops together but he doesn't actually identify as a pagan he's kind of agnostic um it's more he's interested but he's not a believer that sounds similar to my husband <laughs> mm. <laughs> can you tell me your best and or worst witchcraft experience and how it affects and explain how it affects your practice now well I'd say that some of my best and worst experiences of witchcraft have kind of been in large groups. Now, um, when large groups work together, it, it can be absolutely amazing. I mean, the combined energy of everyone working together with one purpose can be really, really powerful. However, when those groups start to bicker or um, uh, don't work so well together, um, then it can be, you know, I've been to some big witchcraft um, events that have really broken down because of people very much being at cross purposes. Um, and it's the same on social media. I mean, you know, it can be absolutely wonderful to be part of an online community and they can be really helpful. People answer questions. and But on the other hand, you can then have some massive row about something and it could be really awful. So I think that it's, it's yeah, it's, it's large groups. Best and worst is large groups. <laughs> how does it, how does it make you change what you do now? Mm, or has, yeah. has it changed anything that you do? Uh, yeah, I, and I'm, I think it is one of the reasons why I am solitary. I've been in groups that have been absolutely amazing um, um i've been in groups that have just drifted apart because people have moved away but there was one in, and i'm not going to go into the details because it's you know it's private but there was one group i was part of that really self-destructed in a in an unpleasant way with people saying all sorts of horrible things about each other and um if you're solitary you 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 don't you don't get that yeah and yeah <laughs> i've experienced that too yeah it wasn't witchcraft but yeah I've, I've experienced that mm. now you mentioned social media do you feel like social media has any effect on your practice well um I write a blog and I have done for about 15 <laughs> years so yeah <laughs> but I mean you know um things have changed so much over that time um I mean uh I mean nowadays it, back in the early days just writing a blog was enough but nowadays you really do have to be um present on so many different platforms and um you know um i have to say i've, I've kind of 
TikTok scares me. Those yeah, it's... I don't. <laughs> I don't TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I'll look at them, but that's about as far as I go. Yes, yeah, same here. How do you feel that you use social media to affect others? Um. Well, I mean, certainly people read my, particularly um, my events page on my blog. I and mean, once a week, I post a week listing of events. Mostly, at one time, it was really all in-person things in and around London. But since um, the pandemic, there's been so much more online. So a lot of what I list is um, online things. And I constantly get people saying how they're really grateful that um, through my blog, they became aware of talks or workshops that they've really enjoyed. Can you refresh us on your blog so maybe people here can visit those workshops? <laughs> Yeah, certainly. It's called a Bad Witches blog, and you can find it at www.badwitch.co.uk. Because as you were saying it, I was thinking, oh, I would love that if somebody would do that here, but it's online, so I can. <laughs> yeah, a lot of them are. A lot of them are. I mean, I, I you know, I, not all of them. Um, and I do, I, yeah, no, no, I mean, I, but I we mean. We can click through and figure it out. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, um, yeah. There's, there's a lot that are. Do you feel like you owe anything to your, the readers and your followers? I, I do try to m provide good content. Yes. Um, I mean, um, sometimes when I'm not feeling very inspired and I write something that's, it's like, it feels like it's something that I've perhaps done before. It's a bit repetitive. Um, I sort of think, oh dear, I hope they're not disappointed in that. Oh. <laughs> What's been the most surprising thing about the blog? Uh, the fact that it's, the fact that it's kept going for so long and ultimately, if it wasn't for writing the blog, I probably wouldn't have written the books that I wrote. I mean, as I said, I started it really more as, um, something to spur me on to do more things. Um, but um, re because of the blog, I, I mean, the, I got to work for Moon Books because I was reviewing some books. Um, I reviewed quite a lot of books on my blog. Um, and there was a Moon Books. It wasn't even Moon Books. It was uh, another John Hunt publishing imprint. And I reviewed one that had quite a few um, typos in it. And so I thought, oh, I wonder if they need a proofreader because I have worked in, in publishing for many years and um, I do do freelance proofreading. And I, I contacted them and said, do you need a proofreader? And they said, yes, we do. We do need a freelance proofreader. So I started doing um, freelance proofreading and uh, copy editing for them. And then I said, well, um, you know, could I put in a proposal for a book? And they said, oh, yes, go ahead. So that was how my Candle Magic book came, came about. And that sold very well. And then um, on the back of that, um, Treadwell's Bookshop in London asked me to run workshops there, um, which I was doing regularly. And um, that book was a success. So I wrote my poppet book and, um, and, and my other book. So, yeah, it's, it, I do feel I love what I do. And but it, it kind of wasn't planned. It, 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 it was more things fell into place after I started writing the blog. I like things. I like when things fall into place. Mm. How would you say witchcraft has changed your life? That's kind of difficult to answer because I think there's always been a kind of a, a sense of of things magical in my life as you know from my family background even I think I've always had an interest in those things um the fact that I now actually call myself a witch rather than just being someone who's perhaps interested in tarot reading or whatever um isn't a huge change so I just don't know who or what I would be if it wasn't for that, um, I, I'd probably be some form of writer because that's I've always loved writing. And, you know, um, I mean, I worked 
in, for a local newspaper as a, a feature writer and sub editor for many years. So I'll probably still be doing um, probably just still be doing that kind of thing. It's interesting to me to hear how different the presence of witchcraft is in your life versus other people I've interviewed. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think, or at least uh, how they talk about it. Sorry to interrupt, but at least how they talk about it, it seems different. Hmm. I mean, I can remember. I think that I do remember shortly after I started actually training in witchcraft, um, noticing a difference in my kind of um, powers of intuition as it were, um, sort of, I did notice there was one particular occasion shortly after I started training in witchcraft when I suddenly had an inkling in my lunch hour in work that I needed to take a certain road. And I, and literally a road, I don't, I'm not talking metaphorically. Um, and I bumped into someone who I hadn't seen since university, who was a really, really bad place and we went to a cafe together and he just talked about all his problems um and I was really pleased I could be there for him um I was late back for work and got into trouble but it it was worth it and I remember thinking I, I think that I've noticed also a lot of people when they are just starting out on a witchcraft path or, or start in a, on a new level of training and noticing sort of a, things that happen like that, that perhaps they might not have noticed before. I do love intuition stories. Mm. They're some of my favorites. I think that's just, that's at least something I have experienced. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I can relate to those. Now, as a Wiccan, obviously you celebrate holidays and Sabbaths. What's your favorite holiday? Always the one that's just coming up. I always think, <laughs> oh, this is my favorite. But I think, no, this is my favorite. I, it's very hard to say. I, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, the thing is, I'm, I mean, like at the moment I'm looking forward to Imolk, but it's like whenever that usually that happens and you think oh that's brilliant i'm gonna go out and meet i mean uh, recently i've been meeting with a druid group locally Ooh. and so they they well they celebrate outdoors and you think oh my god it's the start of spring it's always so cold still you're standing on a hilltop and it's absolutely bitter oh my gosh yeah let's move to the the witch community mm. Is there anything you dislike about it? And we will come back up with like. Well, I think I really um, talked a little bit about that before. It can be it can be bitchy. There can be so many disagreements. Um, you know, um, I think it's, you know, it can be, I think it can be quite, certainly on social media, it can be a very harsh environment. Um, you know, and someone will share a meme that, is perhaps not historically accurate and then people will lay into them and uh, I think the bitchiness is is the difficult part of it it would be nice if people could be more supportive especially of people who are quite new to the path and and there's a lot of information out there you might have read books or just picked up other information online that isn't as accurate. And we've all made those mistakes. I mean, I, I know that, you know, when I was just starting out, you know, I'm, I think about some of the things that I thought were correct and I now know aren't. Um, and I, I just think it would be nice if people could um, be a little bit more um, polite, <laughs> I think. Kind, <laughs> polite, yes. Mm. What do you like about the Wish community? Um, the fact that it is so big these days, you know, it, it, it's at one time it wasn't, you know, back in the 1980s, it was so tiny compared with what it is now. And the fact that it's so much easier to meet up with other witches, even if you might not be able to meet up with them in person. Um, back in the day before the internet, 
you know, you, you had to like go to occult bookshops and look at the mm -hmm. notices on their on their boards or or perhaps get a copy of Pagan Door magazine and look at where meetings were. But nowadays it is so much easier to to meet up with other people. What is something that you wish was discussed more in the witch community? I mean, it, it, think, it is discussed a lot, a lot more than it was, but I think inclusivity um, can, could, is, is still something that needs to be tackled a lot more. Um, it is it is still, you know, an open ritual is quite likely to be planned for somewhere that people who are using wheelchairs can't get to um, or um, are not so suitable for perhaps elderly people who need the toilet all the time or whatever, you know. Um, so I do think that making things more accessible and more inclusive um, is something that certainly does need to be discussed a bit more. Do you know, I am embarrassed that I didn't think about that part with the bathroom. Because I, I do think about, because I've worked with the elderly. <laughs> Mm. And I forgot about that ap that aspect. Oh, <laughs> it, I know. I'm. Mean, I was a carer for my disabled mum for a few years until she died, and so I became far more aware of what wheelchairs can mm -hmm. do or what they can't, and what help people need in bathrooms and so on. Yeah, and if it's a, like you're off in the woods, a porta potty is going to be very hard to manage. Mm. Yeah. Oh my gosh, with like a walker. Oh my gosh. Mm. What is something, do you have any words of advice for anybody just starting out? I think read as much as you can, um, um, learn as much as you can, but also think for yourself and does it feel right to you? You know, if something doesn't feel right to you, then don't do it. Um, and don't cast a spell in haste. Think about it. Think, is this really what I want? I mean, in particular, I see a lot, certainly in the moment, a, a lot of people rushing to curse someone mm -hmm. because they've annoyed them. And there can be a place for curses, in my opinion, but they're not necessarily the first choice that you should do. Not and so they I think, you a bitch on Facebook. <laughs> precisely, precisely. You know, you, 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 realistically, you might be doing far better off doing a spell to sweeten them up than to make them feel more angry. What would you like to hear from somebody more experienced than you yourself? For oh, you? What would I like? Uh, um, I always love going to talks and conferences and hearing talks by people who are far more experienced than myself. Um, in particular, I love learning more about the history uh, of, of witchcraft. Um, uh, I mean, for me, Professor Ronald Hutton is someone who I could listen to all day. Uh, I know that in America, he's not so popular as he is in England. He's a bit of a national treasure in England, but, um, his his insights are um you know his knowledge of history and his in and his knowledge of the pagan community i think um i, I love every book that he's written and um I, I, yeah i can always listen to him he recently did um a, the Eng english heritage podcast they did a a podcast on um post christmas customs and um uh, Professor Ronald Hutton was interviewed for that. So, and that's something that people can catch up on. So, yeah, I would recommend if people haven't heard Professor Ronald Hutton talking, then go to the English Heritage podcast and listen to his um, him talking about post Christmas customs. What or who would you say are the three biggest influences on your practice? Well, um, apart from my family, um, the first person I really trained with in witchcraft, and it wasn't Wiccan training so much, um, it actually wasn't a Wiccan, um, it was a person called Sean of, who ran House of the Goddess in London, and um, she ran courses in circle work. And 
uh, she wrote, also wrote a book called Circle Work. So she was hugely influential um, to me. Then um, I, after that, I joined a, a Wiccan training coven and the, the high priestess there, um, sadly, she's no longer with us. Um, she was someone called Maureen Brown. She's not very well known in in the history of paganism, even in London, where she was based. But she should be because she ran the most brilliant training coven um, uh, and m much loved by everyone who, who was in her coven. Um, so those those are two people. Um, and the third person, um, I'm probably going to say Vivian Crowley, um, who wrote um, Wicca um, and a religion for the, I've forgotten the exact title, but it's it's Wicca, a religion for the new millennium or something like that. Um, uh, but a brilliant book then and still a brilliant book now. And she's an absolutely amazing person um, uh, who I, I know moderately well. I've, I've met her at quite a few different pagan events and uh, um, is a lovely person as well as um, very, very knowledgeable. And jumping from that, who would you like to, who do you think it would be interesting for me to have on the show to, to have this sort of conversation with? Um, well, you can't get Maureen Brown on the show because she can do a seance. Um, I believe that Sean is, I believe Sean's still around. Uh, I don't know where she is. I think she moved to Wales. Um, uh, Vivian Crowley, if, yeah, absolutely. If you could interview Vivian Crowley, that'd be brilliant. I've mentioned Morgan Daimler. Um, and yeah, I mean, if you haven't interviewed Morgan Daimler already, do interview her. She's um, really, really knowledgeable about um, uh traditional Irish magic and um, fairy craft as well, fairy um, fairy traditions, very, very knowledgeable. If I had someone um, who could geek out about words with me, I would, my heart would burst. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd talk to, yeah, 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 absolutely. Morgan Day. That would be amazing. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I think, yeah, that's three people, isn't it? Is there anything else you wanted to bring up that I didn't ask you? Um, not really. Um, I think we've covered a lot of stuff. I would love for you to talk about your book that's coming out. Yeah, my, my scrying book. That's coming out in February, although there are actually already some copies on sale at Treadwell's Bookshop because I made sure... Um, I, the, the people at Treadwell's Bookshop have been absolutely wonderful. They are... Um, an amazing bookshop in London um, and um, they've been absolutely lovely to me and hosted launch parties for, for my books in the past and I've taught workshops there so I've made sure that 30 copies of my scrying book um, reached the shop earlier this week um, so that's Neat. like yeah so that's a good month before it's officially published um, so yeah, you can go to Treble's bookshop and, um, they should have a copy hopefully. And that's all 30 have sold out already. That would be absolutely lovely. I'm not sure that they have. Um, so yes, my scrying book and it's called, uh, Pagan Portal Scrying and it covers crystal balls, um, dark mirrors and other types of mirrors, scrying in water, in cauldrons and bowls, and also scrying in nature. So like cloud scrying and um, looking into the branch of the trees or listening to the sounds that the trees make, scrying in fire. And at the end of the book, I look into um, tea leaf reading, which is, of course, a form of scrying. Um, and I cover a lot of different methods that you can use to, um, to get better at doing it. Um, and um, also kind of I always think that it's better to use an intuitive approach if you see symbols. But it can help to see how other people have interpreted them in the past. So at the back, there's a kind of list of some uh, some things that different symbols can mean. I really liked it. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm looking forward to trying some of the methods that you mentioned in there. I have two more questions. Okay. 
that I know are not on the list. They're not scary. They're just for fun. Would you please recommend something to the listeners? Uh, a book. Um, um, whatever you want. Anything? It could be anything at all. Soup. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> if you like a particular song right now, whatever you're obsessed with right now, recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Well, um, I, I collect tarot decks. I, I have a huge collection of tarot decks. And um, one that I got, I think, actually about a year ago, might even be a bit more than that. Um, and it's... Um, it's a, um, the Witch's Tarot, and it's it's published by Hay House. Now, I wouldn't normally recommend Hay House Tarot decks because they can be a little bit wishy-washy. But this Witch's Tarot is absolutely amazing. Um, it's a little bit different from something like the Ride White, um, Ride White Smith Tarot. Um, it, some of the interpretations are a bit different, but for each card, they kind of... Um, they deliberately kind of um, journeyed and visualized meanings for each card, which, and some of them are just really resonate. Um, it's a beautiful deck as well. So, yeah, I mean, I'd say that if you're into tarot decks, then that is that is definitely worthwhile having a look at. Did you say two things or just one thing just to recommend? One. I have two questions. Okay. That's the first okay. one. Okay. <laughs> okay. The second question is, please tell me a story that you love to tell. It doesn't have to be about anything witchy related at all. It can be something silly that happened to you when you were a kid, like when you get together with family or friends. Remember back when that dumb thing happened and you all laugh? <laughs> mm. That's my favorite mm. kind of story. <laughs> like if you're sitting around the table with tea and just chit-chatting that story. Oh, <laughs> or a beer. Oh, Maybe a beer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've gone completely blank. Um uh there is something that I've reviewed it's a little while ago and I was I was buying some my, my I had a, my cat back then um was not very well and I was buying him very expensive cat food because he was really not very expensive and um really not very expensive, nearly really not very well. And um anything to encourage him to eat was was what I was getting. So I got some really expensive cat food. And I was leaving the supermarket and the uh, security guard outside the supermarket looked in my trolley and said my goodness, you've you've bought very expensive cat food for your cat. Huh? Um, he goes, when I die, I want to come back as your cat. <laughs> and, and I was thinking, you might not want to, you might not want to actually want to be saying that to a witch. <laughs> it's interesting that the security guard knows what expensive cat food is. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's been a really fun chat. <laughs> I've enjoyed it. It's so yeah, good. it's been a fun chat. Everybody be sure to go check out her new book when it comes out. This episode should be releasing right about when the book does. And I will see you on the internet. Bye. Bye. I got another review. This is from Book Lit Podcast on Apple Podcasts, who says, A balm to my soul. I love Kim and the energy of everyone she interviews. I love hearing all the different ways people see and practice the craft. I'm still figuring out my place in this magical world, and Kim is not only introducing me to new ideas and people, but also feels like a close friend. I highly recommend to all... Everybody be sure to go check out her new book when it comes out. This episode should be releasing right about when the book does. And I will see you on the internet. Bye. Bye. I got another review. This is from Book Lit Podcast on Apple Podcasts, who says, A balm to my soul. I love Kim and the energy of everyone she interviews. I love hearing all the different ways people see and practice the craft. I'm still figuring out my place in this magical world, and Kim is not only introducing me to new ideas and people, but also feels like a close friend. I highly recommend to all witches, but specifically new ones. Thank you, Kim, for everything you do. That's so sweet. Thank you. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode of Your Average Witch. 
You can find us all around the internet on Instagram at Your Average Witch Podcast, Twitter at Average Witch Pod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash Your Average Witch Podcast, at Your Average Witch.com, and at your favorite podcast service. Want to help the podcast grow? Leave a review. You can review us on Amazon and Apple Podcasts, and now you can rate us on Spotify. You just might hear your review read at the end of the next episode. To rate Your Average Witch on Spotify, click the home key, click on Your Average Witch podcast, and then leave a rating. You can also support the show by going to patreon.com slash cleverkinscurios. If you'd like to recommend someone for the podcast, like to be on it yourself, or if you'd like to advertise on the podcast, send an email to youraveragewitchpodcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you in the moon changes. <laughs> <laughs>